So just to kick us off, my name is Katie Kaur. I'm the president and CEO of the Nashville Public Education Foundation. And tonight we're gonna to be talking about a really critical, uh, important topic in Metro schools and in the nation as a whole, which is how the district serves its special education students. Um, this is part of a broader series at the National Public Education Foundation, where we are talking through district services and supports for different student populations. We did a recent webinar on English learner students in our, pop, in our district. Um, today is on special education. We will continue to have deeper conversations on the role that the district plays in supporting different groups of students. We are thrilled to have a fantastic panel for you tonight to give you an insider view of what special education is like in our district, how we serve our students and the needs of our special education students. We are excited to have both uh, practitioners, teachers, and principals, as well as the head of special education for the district, but most excited to have a voice of a student um, on our panel tonight who is a senior at East Magnet. So we are thrilled to have all of you and look forward to hearing from you shortly. Um, our agenda is pretty straight forward. We will start with um, a brief welcome, which I just gave, and I'm going to talk through a couple of quick facts about special education in MMPS. There's a lot of terminology in education in general, and specifically in special education, there's some phrases and terms that we want to share with you on the front end that might help when we get into our panel discussion. The majority of the time tonight will be the discussion, which will be moderated by our one and only, the fabulous Zach Barnes. Um, many of you on this call will know Zach, not just in his role at Austin P, but more importantly, his role as an MMPS special education teacher for many years. So we're thrilled to have him come back um, and moderate this panel for us. So let's start with just some general context about special education in MMPS. Um, there, it's really important to know that special education covers a wide gamut of, of differences that students have. It is not a one size fits all. Um, in 1990, the Individuals with Disabilities Act was passed by the federal government. And it, in that act, it identified 13 different disability categories. And, and this is how a lot of our special education is framed basically because we're following federal protocol. Um, but the majority of, uh, not the majority, but the vast, the largest number of students in special education are in this, what's categorized as specific learning disability. Um, this is like dyslexia or challenges with interpreting um, different words, dysgraphia, am I saying that right, Debbie? Um, other, other disorders that, that prohibit a student from learning um, as easily. Other health impairment is another large category in this bucket. This is ADHD or other issues that can prevent a student from focus or staying on task. Autism spectrum disorder and emotional disturbance, depression, anxiety, speech or language impairment, visual impairment, deafness, hearing impairment, deaf and blind students. Uh, it's obviously very rare, but we do have at least one student in our district who's deaf and blind. Um, orthopedic impairment, which is like a cerebral palsy, something that prevents movement and um, intellectual disability, traumatic brain injury. And then there's several students in our district, many students in our district who have multiple disabilities across several of these categories. Across the country, 14% of students um, are, are identified as special education students. And, and, and that's a significant uh, amount of students. And in our district, it's a little bit lower than that, somewhere around 10%, but it is still a significant portion of our student population. And obviously we need to make sure that we're meeting the needs of, this, of these students. Just like everything in education, we have a variety of terms to throw at you tonight. Um, we, in the district, we actually do not call it special education. We talk about it as exceptional education. Um, that was an intentional decision by the district several years ago to encompass the wide range of learning differences that students have. And it also includes um, students with gifted and talented um, designations. So it's a, it's a big category. And of course, the head of exceptional education, our own Debbie McAdams, will be um, speaking on, on to us tonight. 
Uh, related services is something you might hear from our panelists about, and these are additional supports um, and services that are provided to students outside of the classroom. So things that teachers are not actually um, instructing the student in, but also the student might need, like speech therapy or occupational therapy, other, other types of therapies. You hear a lot about both modifications and accommodations, and I just want to clarify the difference between these two. Modifications are things that are, are adjusted in the curriculum, um, things that are adjusted in terms of what the student is being taught. So the student uh, maybe with, a, with certain um, learning differences might actually need to be taught a different uh, set of learning goals than a student in another classroom. Accommodations are how the student might learn the material. So they might be um, able to re to listen to a book on audio tape or have extra time on a test. So that those are the accommodations that are provided to a student to meet his or her or their um, learning needs. If you are anywhere close to the special education conversation, you have heard the term IEP, which is an individualized education plan. Uh, this is prescribed by the federal law, IDEA, that, that that was passed in 1990. And it lays out, the district works with the student and the schools um, to lay out their learning goals. And it provides details of how the district and the school are going to um, support the, the student in meeting those goals. You also might've heard of the term 504 plan. This is also a plan to meet students' learning needs, but it's not quite as prescriptive as an IEP. And it's also um, you know, less specific. So it, it, it does include how the types of supports that will be provided, but it doesn't go into the level of detail and doesn't include the student's entire learning profile, for instance. Debbie, anything you wanted to add there to clarify on, on these terms? No, I think you're doing a great job. <laughs> well, that's amazing because um, this is your topic. So, um, okay. We wanted to give people a sense before we get into our Q&A and panelist conversation, how the MMPS students break down in terms of special education. So um, no surprise, the category that I was mentioning earlier, the specific learning dis disabilities like dyslexia is the largest percentage of students um, with special education needs in our district. About a quarter of all students classified as special education are in this category. Another, um, about a fifth of our students are in uh, this speech or language impairment category. 15% um, are in the other health impairments. A lot of our ADHD or ADD students are in this bucket. Autism covers about 13% of our students with special education services. 10% are developmentally delayed students. Um, intellectual disability, about 8%. Emotional disturbance, dis um, depression, anxiety, or another form of, of emotional disturbance is 5%. And then you have a variety of smaller 1%, 2% of our district who are in these visual impairment, orthopedic impairment, and traumatic, traumatic brain injury. Um, areas. As I did mention, there's uh, one student who in the district, I believe right now, who is deaf and blind. And so you, you have a large range. And I think it's really important before we get into our discussion with our panelists to recognize the wide spectrum here of learning needs. Of course, all students, regardless of whether you have an IEP or a 504, have a different learning style and learning need. And our teachers work tirelessly to meet students' needs. Um, but the fact that special education covers this range is, is actually pretty, um, pretty amazing. And, and that's why I, I think it's so important to understand how the district meets all of these needs and what it's doing collectively to address students' concerns. Another thing that the district um, is very thoughtful about and uh, is very important to the philosophy of the district is to provide students with the LRE or the least restrictive environment. Um, the, the, it, that means that in general, we want our students, regardless of your special education designation, to be in a general education classroom with peers who are not special education students. Um, that is on the far left side, you see least restrictive, where we want students in the, in the, the general ed classrooms for the majority of the day. As students' needs increase, though, we have times where we need to do pullouts, where we pull students out to have one-on-one -on -one, or they're in certain um, smaller group sessions for portions of the day or even for most of the day. And so you can see that as you move to the right, 
um, it's considered more restrictive as you get over to the right, where if you have, for instance, a school that is 100% special education focused, that is not in the least restrictive environment, although certainly is necessary and meets the needs of students um, in those environments. And fortunately tonight, we will hear from, from our wonderful principal at one of those schools. So it's important to remember that the goal is not to siphon off students and make them feel like they're different or, um, or have some sort of special need. It's not that at all. It's actually to make sure that we're meeting all the unique needs of all of our students and, and addressing the special concerns of special education students. Another important um, thing to, to just flag before we get into our panel is the amount of opportunities and ways that the district helps uh, families and students engage in exceptional education in our district. The first is this inclusive instruction, which is um, a least restrictive environment to try to get students in the general ed population as much as possible. Um, another is child find, which is a part of IDEA, and it requires districts to make sure that there are family outreach opportunities for students, for their students with disabilities. We also, um, we should note that we have an Exceptional Education Family Advisory Council, which is a group of family members who meet on a regular basis with, um, with the special education team and in the district to provide feedback and advice and support on, um, on issues relative to special education. And then transition services. Uh, there's actually a, a significant effort put into vocational training and other supports for students who have disabilities but have graduated out of um, their special education program or received a diploma from the district. So it's just a little bit of a quick snapshot on how the district supports students. What we wanna get into now is their own voices and hear from our teachers, our students and, um, and our colleagues about the way special education plays out in the district. Oh wait, I had one more slide, I apologize. Didn't, I, this is important because the budget is critical to special education. Um, we do have about $80, 000, $80 million that are devoted to special education each year. About half of that, over half of that is to special education teachers and then another quarter of that or so goes to paraprofessionals and other teaching staff. And then we have um, full education, special education schools uh, and so supervision and substitutes that you can see here. Special education um, does come with a price tag because it has additional sa staffing needs and it is critical that we get the funding that we need to support our special education students. So now I wanna just pause there. And um, I know that was a lot of information, but I just wanted to provide a baseline of discussion topics. And I'm gonna turn it over to our wonderful colleague, um, Zach Barnes. So Zach is a current uh, assistant professor at Austin P, but previously, like I mentioned on the call at the beginning, he was a special education teacher in MMPS for five years. And he's just a fantastic person and all around expert in this topic and in many topics. And so we're thrilled to have Zach join us as our moderator for tonight's event. And I am going to now turn it over to him and let him introduce the rest of our panelists. Hey everyone, thank you so much, Katie. Um, let's like to say I would love this PowerPoint because I basically do a whole class, a whole semester of what you just talked about today. And it's a, a lot of information, um, very important information. Um, before I begin, um, I'm Zach Barnes. Love that I'm here today. Um, I spent five great years in MMPS being a special education teacher. And MMPS, I would say as top tier special education professionals um, working for our students. Um, but first, I want to kind of go down the list and have each person introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about yourself. So I will start um, with Debbie McAdams. So good evening. Um, my name is Debbie McAdams. I'm the executive director for the Department of Exceptional Education with Metro Nashville Public Schools. Um, I've worked as a teacher in Metro Nashville. I've worked as a principal in Metro Nashville and as a director. And um, prior to that, I worked for a um, lab school for Lehigh University. Um, all in special education. So my entire um, career has all been in special education and it's a privilege to be here tonight. And Debbie knows a lot of information. I have been in many meetings um, with Debbie McAdams during my time, very knowledgeable. Um, another important role in special education are the parents. So Tiffany, if you're introduce yourself. Yes, thank you guys for having me. I'm Tiffany Acuff. Uh, thank you, Debbie. I think she actually referred me to this. Um, I am the current chair of the MMPS 
Exceptional Education Family Advisory Council. So um, Debbie and Mason Bellamy um, are amazing enough to squeeze me into their schedule on a weekly basis just to have that communication going um, that I go back and relay to our parents via a active Facebook group and um, just gather thoughts, information, tell them about opportunities like this, and um, just trying to bring us into the, especially during COVID, um, social media platform to keep communication going. And EFAC is so important for our families to go to and get um, really good information. Um, we're lucky to have a, a principal here today from a school that's a little different, which I'm so excited. I have worked with um, and before in my role as a special education teacher. So Casey, if you introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me, Zach and Katie and everyone. My name is Casey Winfrey, and I'm the principal at Cora House School. And Cora House School is, of course, as I'm sure most of you know, one of our special day schools in, um, in Metro Nashville. As Katie was going over in her slide, we are one of the three schools that's considered the most restrictive setting for special ed students, but always our goal is to work to, um, to transition children back out to their zone schools. And I think it's so important to say that because uh, just because we are a 100% IEP based school, that doesn't mean that we aren't pushing for inclusion too. And I always wanna put that out there as an asterisk. Prior to being the principal at Cora Howe, I taught at Cora Howe. So I've spent most of my adult life in that program, in that building. And prior to that, I worked in a university setting out in California on Stanford's campus for children who have behavioral disorders. And it was a lot like a special day school too when I was working out in California. So I uh, brought a lot of skill back from that, but it's, um, it's, it's my passion. I love it. It's what I wake up to do every morning. So I'm really honored to be on this panel to uh, talk to everyone who's on here. Thank you. I had a chance to visit Core Howell a few times in my years, and it's like the all-star team of special educators. And it's kind of like people get excited to say, I got a job there, I get to go work there because they're doing amazing things. And what I'm really excited about for this panel is that we have a student. All the things that we do here, we do for students. Um, and so Jonathan, um, would you introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jonathan Kesey. I go to East Nashville Magnet School. I am currently a senior. Um, I have been at Henry Maxwell in elementary school, to Hattie Cotton elementary school, to East Middle, and then now to East High School. Um, I plan to go to college um, to four years, and I hopefully, that's my career, I want to be into broadcasting and also into like theater and uh, arts and film. And I just look forward to it. And I thank everybody for this opportunity for me to be out here for you. Well, we're so excited to have you. Um, so now we're gonna start getting into the fun conversation part of this. Um, and as I told the panelists before this, I could talk about this all day. I literally talk about this for my job. I get paid to do this and I love this. So um, but the first question is for Debbie. Katie talked a lot about all the different laws. We have IDEA, which was passed in 1990, was reauthorized in 2004. But then you're also dealing with local education laws as well. Um, the budget plays a role in the, how we're funded through federal dollars. So how does all that, how do you make sense of all that and put it in place at our local district? Okay, thank you. So um, obviously MMPS, as, as Katie said, we're committed to ensuring that all students are afforded their rights as outlined in the federal law. The federal law being the Individual with Disabilities Education Act that you just referred to too, um, Zach. So we call that IDEA. So you, you'll hear me refer to that. You'll hear other special education um, people refer to IDEA. So the IDEA ensures that all eligible students with disabilities receive a free appropriate appropriate public education and ensures special education and related services to children. So the IDEA, the big federal law, governs how states and public agencies provide early intervention, special education, and related services, and it outlines the rights for the parents of students with disabilities. So we have the big federal law, and then some examples of state-level policies that are reinforced are the rights of the families within 10 days to have an IEP meeting 
and um, we are obligated to provide a 40, um, within 48 hours, a draft of the student's IEP. The state reinforces a 60 day timeline for initial evaluations through the child find process that Katie referred to. The state reinforces that all students have access to the least restrictive environment. The state has laws on positive behavioral supports and dyslexia. The state ensures that um, accommodations as outlined in the IEP are occurring within the state assessments. So everything that's outlined in IDEA, then there's additional responsibilities that the state rolls out through policies and practices. And then the state ensures that IDEA compliance with, um, through monitoring. Um, so the state engages with us often because we're a large urban district um, with monitoring. So we've had IEP monitoring twice already this school year. We're about to embark on a big um, ESEA and IDEA monitoring in February. Um, and we've also had fiscal IDEA monitoring. So the state is constantly providing us with best practices and monitoring and giving us feedback on how we can do things better. So we have IDEA at the federal level, level, all our state policies and practices. And then at the district level, again, we're committed to students receiving that free and appropriate public education in their least restrictive environment. So all students have access to tier one instruction. So meaning all students have access to grade level content, your English language arts, your math, in their least restrictive environment. And as Casey said, for some of our students, the least restrictive environment may be in a self-contained school at that point. And that's all decided within an IEP team. So often students require differentiation and accommodation so they can access that grade level content. But in addition to that, we provide intensive intervention in the areas of need which supports growth toward mastery and standards of that core content areas. So just kind of a broad overview, <laughs> MMPS develops policies and practices and procedures, which are based on the federal law of IDEA and then the state policies and then the best practice guidance. So I know that was a mouthful, Zach, sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, it's so important for people to understand all the policies that are in place to protect students, um, right. to really do what's best for students. And there's so many layers, but as a special education teacher when I was one in Metro, I felt that MMPS did a great job of sharing that to us through coaches, through professional development throughout the semester. It's a lot of work, but also as we go and talk through the rest of today, it's talking about how important it is to engage our families because Debbie knows this left and right. I may know a little bit, but her families are a whole different bar ball game. They're trying to raise children, work all day, um, and so that's why like EFAC is so important. Um, so thank you, Debbie, for that. Um, as we're thinking about working with other students with disabilities, um, Tiffany, I want to start with you. What do you think are some common misconceptions that you encounter about um, best ways to support exceptional education students? And I, I bet when you're working with families, going to the communities, you hear a lot about this. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, this is an interesting question. I have to say that I did open this up to the EFAC um, because I didn't want to be just speaking from my own personal experience since I am representing um, a large group of parents. And a couple of the things that came up was um, often feeling like uh, exceptional education students are either misunderstood or underestimated. Um, misunderstood in terms of uh, an academic issue being a behavioral issue, like the child is choosing not to do well, when in reality, it's more about ability. And with um, the correct accommodations or a different method, we might be having a different outcome here. And so I think that, and then the underestimated, um, just feeling like, you know, our kids can't do the work, you know? Um, I think that a lot of people, and I think this is far beyond MMPS, Zach, and you know this, I'm preaching to the choir here, but for, for anybody at home listening, and you guys probably, if you're listening to this, also know, I think our society underestimates um, people with disabilities. And so I think that is the classroom is not exempt from that, I will say. Um, and depending on a general ed teacher's experience, you know, um, it's implicit bias. And so I think that there is often um, an underestimation that comes with our child's IEP. I think you touched on a lot of good things. And I think um, as I'm thinking about it as from training those general education teachers is that sometimes we in higher ed, we don't do a good enough job on helping prepare teachers to go out. And I think it really comes to 
us through professional development and working with those teachers. But again, it's this implicit kind of bias. They're not out there thinking it because um, they don't want to teach students with disabilities. As right. Debbie and others were talking about, it, there's a lot of strategies in place. And so hopefully things okay. like today will start to talk about how uh, students with disabilities can achieve um, yes. with given the right accommodations um, and interventions. And if I can say one more thing, because you kind of touched on it, the second part of the responses that I received really talked about that top down approach, um, how influential principles can be um, on an exceptional education student's success. Um, you know, the way that they're supporting those teachers, the opportunities for that PD. So yeah, it really is an entire village and um, all of the teachers are involved. So yes, that's, that's my answer. And, and I love, I mean, when you have a good principal who's really there to oh. help support you, it oh, makes you a think. huge difference. <laughs> um, now, now, Jonathan, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Um, any type of misconceptions that you encounter about students with disabilities? Um, I think that some people think that exceptional students, uh, exceptional education students only need help just like from exceptional education teachers. They also, they also believe that students that have a educational dis disability are either are having behavior problems or special needs. Um, people also think that they are just low and can't do all the work as their peers are doing. Um, exceptional education students need to just need to go to their except, exceptional education teachers for help if they feel lost or anything. I'm going to have to bring you to one of my classes because I think you touched on the core part of things that um, special education teachers and practitioners are really trying to help with. And I think we want to incorporate everyone together so we're not saying the worst thing that we can hear as a special education teacher is your student. Your student yeah. did this. It's all of us together educating all students. Um, so thank you, Jonathan. I think you've hit on some core issues that I think the field has been dealing with for a really long time. Um, mm -hmm. Now, something that I love to talk about is best practices that support students with disabilities but also support all students. And I think this is sometimes, I think Jonathan is getting to a little bit of this, is that we think that, oh, these practices and strategies we use with students with disabilities um, only work with them, but in reality, they're helping all students. Um, so Debbie, do you see any common practices that are used in schools and classroom that support both students with disabilities and all students? Yeah, so, so whenever I'm asked about best practices, I get a little excited and I'm actually, I work a second job that I'm doing after here to train teachers in another state about this and it's universal design practices and it's exactly what Jonathan is talking about. So, so we provide ongoing professional learning on universal design practices for teachers. So if all educators utilize universal design practices, we can best serve the needs of all students in Davidson County. So I get, I get all excited about this. So, <laughs> um, if anybody has been to any presentation I've done, they would see a slideshow, a, um, cartoon I use and it's about, it's a bunch of students waiting to go into a school building and there is a ramp and there's stairs and there's snow covered it. And there's a student in a wheelchair and um, the custodian is shoveling the staircase. And the student says, if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in, in first, you know, like, so that's a universal design practice. If you just do the ramp, we can all go in instead of doing the stairs, we're not where we all can't go in. So, um, oh, you're showing my slide. <laughs> I'm like, what happened to my, <laughs> all right, hold on, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just totally lost. All right, um, so, so specific practices that fall under universal design that are commonly used in our classrooms are providing choice, vis visual schedules. I don't, I don't care whether it's a special education classroom, a general educa education classroom, vis visual schedules are so important. Pre-teaching, illustrating through multiple media, varying the methods for response and navigations. Many of these strategies can also be done in the virtual setting. So we've really kind of trained a lot of our professional learning to, to show how people and teachers can do this in the virtual setting. Movement breaks, we all need that. We're all sitting in front of computers all day long. Utilizing different platforms, there's Kahoot, SlideCo, Pear Deck, Google Slides, and that's just to name a few. Um, we're training teachers on immersive reader, um, natural reader, which is the read aloud platform for Google Chrome. 
closed captioning for videos. I don't even watch TV anymore unless the closed captioning is on because it helps me process what I'm watching. Um, again, I'm gonna say visuals. You can never have too many visuals in a classroom or within your virtual environment. Sentence starters and frames for ELL, ELA and writing tasks. Um, and then in addition to all of our universal design strategies, we also provide specific training for differentiation strategies. And that's where you get more into the individualized learning for students. And I think Casey's gonna talk more about that. But in order for all these practices to benefit all students, just like Jonathan said, it is imperative that we work together. I think Zach, you said one of our biggest pet peeves is when someone says your students or our students, they are all of our students. So we're very fortunately that in Met, fortunately, fortunate in Metro. So the district is organized and structured so we can make sure that we're collaborating and integrating the work necessary to ensure that all of our students have equitable access to that core instruction and general curriculum. So for example, um, my department is under the teaching and learning department and under teaching and learning, we have EL, advanced academics, pre-K, curriculum and instruction and MTSS. So really MMPS has moved to make sure there's collaboration and integration strategies and supports within all of that content. So by all of us working together and training together, we can help teachers identify students that may be eligible for special education services. And we can make sure students have all, I mean, teachers have all these tools in their toolkit. So in addition to um, equitable access strategies that support access to core instruction for all students, we have heavily invested in interventions that are dyslexia specific and support closing that skill gap so that students can make progress toward mastery of content standards. And this is a combined effort with MTSS and the EE -E academic intervention team. Um, we're using interventions um, district-wide and I think Casey's gonna talk about this too because the data that's coming from this for our students' progress has been, been awesome. Also for our students that have more significant disabilities that are on a modified curriculum, um, we've also purchased some specific programs that have been very beneficial and can be used both in the virtual and in the person environment. So, so the big thing there is the collaboration, universal design, and then differentiation um, for our students' individual needs. We see a lot, we at Austin P are now focusing on UDL to start training our teachers, not just our special education teachers, but our general education teachers. Oh, and so absolutely. My, and, and it's so important to design everything and it's helpful for all students. Now, Casey, um, what practices are you seeing as well in, in the classroom? So Debbie uh, mentioned a lot of the, uh, the, the tools that the district has adopted, especially in the, as we've moved to a virtual environment this, since March. But I, I wanna talk a little bit because I think that the essence of this question is what, what, can we, what can bleed over from exceptional ed into general ed that is best practice? That, that's, that's what I think is uh, at the center of this. So I wanna talk just a little bit philosophically about what I believe and, and how I try to um, incorporate this in my school. Of course, the, um, the, practice, the practices and the, the, the interventions that Debbie mentioned, I'm on board with all of those that, that she went over and the district has put a lot of money into that since March. But philosophically, I believe in this, this concept that I've always called, and if those of you have probably seen me present about this before, some of you have, in this, in this concept of, called the vertical string of mastery, where there's a string that's connected to the floor and to the ceiling. And, we, and at the ceiling is absolute mastery of a concept or absolute mastery of a skill. And at the, at the floor is when you're really struggling with that skill. And we all, students, kids, all people, we all are on those strings of mastery at some point. And that's what we do as uh, special educators. We work hard as interventionists and case managers to identify that exact spot where a child falls on this vertical string of mastery through scientific approaches, right? That's what we do. And, and that's what we believe is, is, is the best approach instructionally for kids. And we use lots of intervention programming like Debbie mentioned to get at this end. Um, we're able to create highly personalized approaches in, at, at Cora Howe and all special educators can create highly personalized approaches when they know that exact spot of mastery for each child through scientific approaches. 
And it's always been my opinion that all children should reap the benefit of those personalized scientific approaches. It shouldn't just be boxed into exceptional ed kids. I think MMPS has made great gains towards this end in recent years with their MTSS efforts. But, you know, I continue to push and it's continue, it continues to be my view, and I think it always will be my view, that intervention and enrichment strategies used in XED are tools that can sharpen the academic, behavioral, and life skills of all children. Uh, and that's something that I always want my Gen Ed colleagues to take away from my work and the work that we do at Cora Howe and the work that's done in special ed, because we all fall on that string somewhere. And the closer we can get to where that mastery point is, the better we can teach. I think that's great. And I think we see in the research that a lot of these practices in special education are preventative. So when we talk about the MTSS and RTI, we're talking about trying to screen students and intervene before it's too late, before it gets to the point that they have a disability. And as Casey was saying, we're all on a string and we have many practices that we don't need to get boxed into and that we really need to be cross collaborating with everyone. We, everyone has different skills. And I just love that Casey's talking about, we do train special educators to get to know the students, know exactly what they need and to intervene with them. And that's what we're trained to do. Um, but also general education teachers are too. They're trained to, to look at all their students and figure out how they can best help the students in their classroom. So again, taking away the box of special ed and general education is helpful for everyone. And as, some, as you're all talking about, we have all these strategies, but COVID, right? We are now doing a lot of things right here on Zoom, dealing with technology issues. I'm um, seeing people's little boxes. I don't see people anymore. Um, but we hear the horror stories, it's difficult sometimes, but there are a lot of good things happening right now. Because let me tell you, this is what we train special educators to do. They are flexible and they can do what it takes to work with students. It's kind of what Casey was talking about. We're trained that way. And so that's what they're doing right now. So I'd love to know um, some of the best practices teachers are doing during virtual learning, kind of what's working well with you or your, your child. So Tiffany, I'd love to hear um, what, what's working. You know, this was a good question for me to kind of sit with and read through some responses um, with the EFAC. It's, it's been a hard week for me and for my son in virtual learning. So it was good to kind of sit, sit with this and really say, what, what is working? You know, I have an IEP meeting this week and I thought, you know what, let's really focus on what is working, what is working for others, what do we need more of? Um, and so the thing that I hope we don't lose, whether we continue with this virtual or go back in person is the um, is the communication piece that I think that this this has been um, really brought to priority in a way that um, you know I've had great communication with teachers in the past but this is above and beyond because it has to be so I hope we don't lose that <laughs> and so um, you know I, I know it, it will change a bit but I really hope it it, it's been so invaluable, I think, to the relationship between my son and his teachers, the way that we have been able to communicate with each other. So that, um, the ability to have a smaller class size, uh, the ability to be, to kind of switch around what would normally be a 20 plus to like a, maybe a smaller group. Um, the biggest thing for me personally that was echoed on this, aside from communication, was the flexibility of chunking learning time, for lack of a better phrase, um, into smaller segments and more breaks. And you know, that's it's necessary for you know a child with autism like mine, who this is a new environment. We don't do school here, you know, to be able to have teachers work with us and say, hey, let's really implement those breaks. Let's let's really focus on a smaller. Um, quantity of time, but more quality. And I think that in an in-person day, you know, when the schedule is dependent on so many other people, we don't always have that opportunity. So that has been a really, I'm going to hold on to that <laughs> as much as I can in the in-person um, setting, because that's been really, really great. And I think that we have really embraced technology in a way that, um, we had not yet experienced in terms of the um, voice to text and the out loud readers and that, you know, having the ability to do asynchronous learning um, when the moment's not right, 
and to be able to go back and to be able to rewind and, you know, go back to lessons that that really is invaluable. And I hope something like that continues um, the way teachers send notes versus just writing on the board, you know, and I'm listing so many things right now, but there really have been some things that I would not have known. I don't get, observe my children's classroom. I would, I would like to every day um, or at least once a year, um, but it's been so good to see, oh, I know my son and this is working, you know, this, this is good for him um, or this is not, <laughs> let's find something else. So that opportunity um, and having teachers communicate on a regular basis and really receiving my feedback and um, being creative with some of those differences. Um, that has been, this is such a unique experience in that for us and I hope that continues. I'm glad to hear some of those good things. And we, when we talk about technology, I think about, I think before we had computers in the room and that was just, <laughs> just there, but having computers in the room is not effective use of technology. And what this has done is now changed us to force us to use technology effectively. And that's a game changer for our students. Now, I'd like to ask Casey as a principal, what are you seeing for some of the effective practices that your teachers are doing and what should they keep doing once we kind of return to in-person learning? Yeah, sure, thanks Zach. I've seen, I've observed a lot of, um, I was having a conversation with Deb about this the other day. I've seen a lot of new and exciting learning that's been evident during virtual learning. And I think this is some of what Tiffany was talking about just now too. And we've seen, I, I know now this is anecdotal, but I've seen an increase in engagement with kids through a lot of the programs that we're using. And empirically, as Debbie was talking about earlier, I've seen some academic gains. Now, we that's not across the boards. I can't say that, but I do have data gains with our kids through the use of the new intervention, virtual intervention platforms that we've been using. Um, it was provided for us at the start of the year, iReady Math and Lexia and LanguageX or LanguageX Live are three programs that I wanna specifically highlight here. And I was so sold on the iReady Math program when I observed it that I went ahead with my own budget money and bought the reading package with, for, for iReady. So all of my students in the building right now have a subscription to both the math and the reading side of that program. Um, and it's, it, it's so very important for us to realize as, as, the, as the old people here, and I get, maybe I'm just talking about myself there, but it's important for us to realize that the students that we're teaching today, they're technology natives. They, they were born with technology in front of them. So using technology is, is very native to them. And much of the virtual experience has been more engaging to our students than what we were doing traditionally. So as a leader, when my intention is to keep many of these approaches in place when we go back to live school, I think it's time to put down the workbooks and the pencils and some of those things in, in light of these new approaches that we've, we've been utilizing. Um, and I also think it's been real neat to observe on the social side because our students, as we've been using these programs like Microsoft Teams and these other platforms, they've started using them too, right? Like they've created their own groups and their own teams and their own things. So we've seen friendships form that wouldn't have necessarily formed otherwise. Because you got to understand Cora Howe is like a magnet school. We draw kids from all over the county and our kids aren't neighborhood friends. They're not easily, it's not easy for them to get together as friends. But our kids have created their own rooms and their own groups and they've been able to forge some friendships outside of school, which is something that we've always found challenging. There's a, there, so there's been a lot of amazing social things happen. And also I've seen success in these platforms with our virtual therapies because we use a lot of behavioral therapists at Cora Howe also. And, we, and of course with our speech and language therapy and our OT therapy, they, those folks have put a lot of creativity into the one-on-one -on -one time that they're spending with students in those therapy sessions. And I know a lot of um, SLPs and OTs in the district, and I know that the, the SLP that I work with is one of them, is even carving out time to have one-on-one face-to-face meetings with parents that's more often and more consistent than it's ever been in the past. 
And I'm going to talk about communication on another question, but since Tiffany already brought it up, communication is is paramount right now. And, and we've seen how important communication is in, in, in the industry and especially in special education. And I think that I've always pushed my school to be good communicators. That's important to me. But like Tiffany said, this has enhanced that even. So that's something that's exciting to me too on the school to parent pipeline. I'm excited to hear about the use of technology, how well it's going. Um, when I have worked with Corhal in the past, there were times when students I, I knew, I used to work at a virtual school um, in Metro, MMPS Virtual School, and thinking about now, think about our students who, for health reasons, are homebound for a brief amount of time, and how now we're going to be much more ready for that transition to and from. We're going to say, cool, okay, you're going for two weeks for surgery. That's okay. We have a video in the classroom, and I'm going to record it and send it to you, and it's going to be so beneficial for our students who don't have time to lose out on instruction for being out for two weeks. But also when you talk about, I grew up with like AOL Instant Messenger and AIM and creating these online groups. And then like college, I have two students, totally different fields who know each other through Twitch. They play games together and they've created a friendship. And so seeing that our students online are creating friendship with each other shows us how important that we can build online communities. Now, I would love to get Jonathan's feedback on this because as before, he just knows everything about the things that we care about. So, so Jonathan, what for you being in the virtual instruction for a long time, we're coming up to a year since the last time you, were, you may have been in school. So like what's working well, and I know you're graduating, um, but what do you think should continue next year for your other students? Um, well, I think the virtual learning platform has like just been great. Um, teachers are more accessible. There's more teaching happening. Um, they have office hours, which I love about that. Um, I like that they record lessons so that you can go back and review them. Um, they do. They also do more check-ins with students to ensure that they are understanding like the material of it. Um, there, there also been an option to pull students into like small groups, like to make it actually seem like everybody's doing group work. Like if you're back in a classroom, have a, that feeling again with your friends working on the project or something. Um, the communication is consistent and the pacing of the assignments is just much better. Um, as you like have a due date for everything, you know like, hey, I need to get this done. Uh, a couple of days before it keeps you just like updated on everything. Um, I think having some work online when students go back will be great. Um, it would be great to keep everyone focused. I like that teachers use online tools and programs to help make learning some accommodating for everyone. And I love that about it. I love to hear that, Jonathan. So you like having the ability to kind of see all your assignments in one place and be able to kind of go back and read it, read up on everything. Yeah, it's like yeah, I like I like that so better. Like say then um, if you're in person and then you're just you're just waiting for the teacher to say when's the next assignment due, just all laid out for you. Then you just have a you have your you can just strategize it and plan it. See what day or what time I want to start doing this. I love it. I think it gets back to kind of something that like Debbie was talking about earlier is having that visual schedule. So now we're kind of giving you something that you can visualize. And let me tell you, you're going to be prepared, prepared for college because that's how we all set up all of our classes. We have a syllabus and we have some due dates and we put something on an online management system. And so you're, you're going to be good if you head over um, to North Carolina for some school. So talking to virtual instruction, Debbie, I'm sorry to have to ask this for you. We're going to talk about reopening. I know that's on everyone's mind, but as we're thinking about reopening, um, we briefly reopened last semester, we, we were bringing back those exceptional students first. Um, so why is it important to bring those back, those students first and that kind of phased in approach? And how, if you have time, talk about like the legal aspects. We talked about IDEA and LRE. And so there's a lot of that goes into, I think, your decision making and how we bring students with disabilities back into the classroom. Sure. So, yes, yeah, very good question. Um, so in order for all of our students, staff and families to be safe, MMPS phased in students during the COVID um, pandemic, as you mentioned. So um, we started the phase in back in September. 
So students with IEPs require specialized instruction and services. And for some students, this is, this is more difficult to access in a virtual setting. I mean, we, we know that, we're aware of that. Um, therefore, we work to serve those students in person when it was safe. So we were able to do that back in December. So it's important to prioritize the return of students with an IEP utilizing a data-based decision-making approach, okay? So when considering students to prioritize for phase-in, we ask school staff to consider a variety of questions. Does the student require hand-over-hand -hand instruction for most learning activities? Do goals require whole group or small group activities that cannot be accomplished remotely? What goals can't be effectively accomplished remotely? Has the student exhibited, re, exhibited regression or recoupment during school breaks in a typical year? Can the student's goals be effectively met during learning according to the CLIP? So the CLIP is something that we did in Metro, which is the Continuous Learning Individualized Plan, where <clears throat> teachers and parents met together, looked at the IEP and determined how we could provide those services in a virtual setting. Another question, is the student able to attend instruction for an age appropriate amount of time with breaks and accommodations? And this is just to name a few of some of the guiding questions we gave out to our school staff to determine the prioritiz prioritiz prioritization of bringing students back um, to in school. Um, so services that we have been able to provide to all students, we're able to provide students with virtual therapy. Casey mentioned that. Um, our, our therapists have done an incredible job setting up platforms and getting that virtual therapy out there. Um, our teachers are doing great jobs ensuring that all students have access to content. They're util utilizing Google Slides um, and they are doing everything that they can to provide access for all of our students. Um, as we mentioned before too, we purchased the reading and math interventions that provided that equitable access across the districts for all the students that demonstrated that need. Um, and students on a modified curriculum. Um, we purchased an online program that we have also seen encouraging data from um, Teach Town, um, Eden, um, News to You, Unique Learning System. So there's a lot of things that we, we have done, but there are, we know that going through that database decision-making process, there are students that we know as soon as it is safe for both our students, staff, and our families that we want them back in our buildings. So, it's a lot of work that goes into it. And so, and as I think Katie mentioned, everyone's talks about the beginning, there's a wide range of students with disabilities. And so it takes a lot of work in figuring out what students need what. So putting my teacher hat on, um, we're really getting close to six. And so what I'm gonna do, we're gonna do a question or two, but panelists, short answers. Okay, so we're thinking about one or two sentences. Um, so Tiffany, in your role as the EFAC chair, what role do families play in the IEP process? And how does that impact the relationship with you, your student, your teachers, and everything else? I know one or two sentences may be hard. Oh my gosh, I mean, it's critical. It's critical. Um, you have to have a team with the gen ed, if, you, if your child is in general education with that teacher, with the exceptional education teacher, with support roles in terms of OT and SLs. Um, you have to, it's, uh, somebody said on the on the um, EFAC page that it's not the special ed teacher's role to fix the student and send them back to gen ed. You know, it ha and unfortunately, a lot of times it might feel that way. And so it's got to be a cohesive unit where we're working together for curriculum modification and just really um, communicating. And I do, before we get off this call, I want to talk about information and communication, but I'll table that for now if you let me come back to it. Okay. okay. Um, so I got and also remember, when we talk about IDEA, parents are supposed to be involved right. in the IEP process. But that, uh, that comes back to communication and information. Okay. And that's why I really want to stress that. And I'll wait if you let me get back to it. You, you got 30 seconds. Okay. Do your, do 30 seconds. okay, so there needs to be equity in information and communication. There needs to be available formats. There needs to be accessibility. When you enter exceptional education, there's a whole new vocabulary. You guys saw the slides, it's overwhelming. And so when you are trying to learn about your child's disability, when you are trying to learn about what, where does my child fall in the spectrum of, of disability? What does their need look like? What does the teacher know and not know about this disability? How does my child need to know how to learn? What are their rights? You know, so 
It's overwhelming. We need more accessibility to information as parents so that we can be available and be our best advocate for our children and know how to communicate with these teachers. Right now, it really feels like you know, when I started this, I was flying blind and I just, I was really blessed to have great, great parents that reached out who were ahead of me in this process. And I really want EFAC to be that, to be available as a resource. And that's so important. You see that it happens a lot when someone, a family experiences disability and they kind of get paired up with someone because you need someone yeah. to help them go through it because yeah. it's so hard. Um, so, okay, we're going to do a quick one. So, um, Casey, what's, what's something that's important that educators can do to support um, EE students? Um, and how does that partnership work between the, the teacher and the student? Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, I, I, I go back to two things I've already mentioned, um, which is personalized individual approaches and also open communication between the, the two disciplines. And when I say disciplines there, I mean gen ed and ex ed. Open and trusting communication is what needs to happen with gen ed and ex ed. It's never, it's never been the job for ex ed to come in. I think you used the word fix or something okay. like that earlier, Zach. It's never been uh, ex ed's job to come in and fix all the problems. That, that's not what the, the intention should be. Uh, we're highly skilled partners that know intervention as much as a gen ed teacher knows content. So it's important that we are able to work as partners with the gen ed, with gen ed teachers, administrators, with everyone on the gen ed side. So, I, I mean, when we're transitioning students back out, it's very important for us to work with the teachers and the admin and receiving schools and make sure that we're building that partnership there so that we can uh, successfully transition kids back to an LRE. So it's, it, I, I can't speak enough about communication between the two disciplines and, and making sure that we are working harmoniously together. It, it's so important. We're going to go real quick to Debbie and then we're going to finish on Jonathan. So Debbie, what are some, some things that educators can do to support students with disabilities and those partnerships between gen ed and special ed teachers? Yeah, I don't know that I can say anything more than what Tiffany and Casey said. Um, I do want to emphasize the, the document, the individual educational program, because there is so much information and a team of people develop that. You have the family, the general ed teacher, the special ed teacher, the EL teacher, um, the related service providers, the student. Jonathan should be sitting in his IEP and advocating for himself. So that document is so important. Everybody should have a copy of that document and know what is in that document and be implementing that document. Um, it should be instructionally appropriate and we have to make sure those partnerships are happening with everybody sitting around that table. Mom, dad, the entire family and all of the staff in the school, the principal. Um, so that's, that would be the one thing I would wanna add to that aside from all the collaboration that needs to happen. And it needs to be important that the general education teachers are there at the table too. Um, 100%. Yes, 100%. So, right. gonna, yes. so Jonathan, as the, the most important person here on this panel, um, what, do you, what do you think are like, what should teachers be doing to help support students with disabilities? Um, I would say to collaborate more I say, I say students should like collaborate more with general education teachers. Uh, they can also set up assignments that meets the needs of students by set it like by just continuing to use online uh, learning programs. I like the cl having classes that offer visuals and where I can listen as well. Um, the virtual setup offers more options. Um, teachers can use uh, these programs and features to set up uh, work according to what the students need. Um, I like that teachers have office hours, like I said, uh, to provide even tutoring. Um, I also like the structure and pace where it doesn't where it doesn't uh, seem that it is moving fast, but it's just right on pace. Jonathan, this is why you are the reason why it's so important to have students involved in this process because you see it from a totally different angle than all of us. So I want to thank you for being here. You're super important voice. And I wanna turn it back over um, to Katie to close us out because we are at time. 
Thank you so much, Zach. And I just, I can't tell you how much I loved this panel. I, first of all, the enthusiasm of our faculty, of our student, of our uh, family member. I mean, it was just, it was obvious how much uh, people are passionate about serving special education students. And it just warms my heart to hear such wonderful um, th things that are happening in our district. So thank you so much on behalf of the National Public Education Foundation um, for joining us tonight. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation. Zach Barnes, you are a moderator extraordinaire. We will invite you back plenty times. So uh, just so you know, and thank you again to Casey, Debbie, Tiffany, and Jonathan for your wonderful insights on this critical topic. Um, this will be posted on our website. So please take a look at that and share it with friends and, and colleagues to spread the word about how, what the district is doing to meet the needs of special education students. And please reach out to us at the National Public Education Foundation for other ideas around webinars that will help inform the public about how the district is meeting the needs of, of our students in general. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Again, big thank you to our panelists and um, to everyone stay safe. Thank you everyone.